Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. Hymn number 402 in your song books. Let's all stand together as we sing Like a River Glorious, hymn number 402. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace over all victorious in its bright increase. Perfect yet it floweth fuller every day. Perfect yet it this morning yeah. is it stayed upon Jehovah there you go. that's where your heart needs to be fully blessed it's where it has to be to be fully blessed let's sing it out on the last Christy if you would drop that on the chorus let's raise our voices a cappella on the chorus every joy or trial falleth from above traced upon our dial by the sun Trust him fully, all for us to do. They who trust him wholly, find him wholly true. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised. Perfect peace and rest. Our Father, we come before you this morning in Jesus' precious and holy name with our hearts fixed on Jehovah. Father, maybe we came into the building this morning with our hearts fixed on something else. Uh, maybe we've been distracted by what's going on this past week. Maybe we're anxious about maybe what's going to come this week. But Father, I pray that through the preaching of your word today, through the singing of these hymns, through our fellowship, that our hearts will be directed to where they need to be, and that is on you. That Father, your word would go through, forth this morning with boldness. Uh, Father, we're thankful that Dr. Harding is here and looking forward uh, to the message you laid on his heart. Now I pray that our hearts will be attentive to what you have for us today. That Father, where as we give in our tithes and offerings, that we would give as cheerful givers with the right heart attitude. That, Father, we would not give begrudgingly, but, Father, just with a heart of deep appreciation for all that you've given us. Father, as we sing these great hymns of the faith, may your name be high and lifted up above all else, and may Jesus Christ be praised. Father, thank you for the privilege to gather today in your name. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Hymn number 591. 591, wonderful piece. We'll sing the first, the third, and the last. First, third, and last, wonderful piece. <clears throat> Far away in the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than song. In celestial like strain it unceasing 
591, if they're having trouble with the screen, 591 on the third verse. I am resting tonight in this wonderful peace, resting sweetly in Jesus' control. For I'm kept from all danger by night and by day, and His glory is flooding my soul. Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray. In fathomless billows of love, a soul are you here without comfort or rest, marching down the rough path. Accept the sweet peace so sublime. <coughs> Wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray. In fathomless billows of love. Excellent singing this morning. Let me go over a few announcements with you. Uh, choir, we will start choir practice tonight at 515. Uh, if you're interested in being part of the choir or you've been in the past, uh, we will be starting that uh, uh, back up tonight at 515. Uh, there's work night this coming Tuesday from 6 to 8. Uh, that'll be for anyone who is uh, willing to attend. Uh, we've got a number of projects to do uh, that doesn't include the building project. We still have some projects that we need to work on. Uh, tree to cut up, uh, things like that. So Tuesday night, uh, work night from 6 to 8. Uh, ladies' activity coming up on Friday uh, the 22nd, March 22nd. That'll be from 6.30 to 8.30 in the A-frame. And uh, just making you ladies aware of that, there will be a sign-up sheet that'll be posted on the back bulletin board. And so we'd like you to sign up for that just so we know how many to prepare for. This time, Brother Randy's going to come and tell us about an opportunity uh, for Resurrection Sunday. Good morning. I just have a quick update on our uh, current two-year uh, capital campaign, the second campaign that we have. Um, we've been through eight months so far, which is about one-third of our 24-month goal. Currently, we have 43,000 as of the end of February, about 43,000. We know some more has come in, in uh, the last week. but So we're a, thir a third of the way through our campaign. We have about 17% of the funds, so we're falling a little bit behind. But as a leadership group, we are steadfast in our belief that God's going to provide for this new building and the projects that we're doing. But and with that being said, we also want to continue to provide you opportunities to give towards this project as well. So this month, we're going to do a $10 Sunday. We're asking that everybody bring $10. It'll be Easter Sunday, March 31st. We'll pass an offering plate around in the early service and in this morning service. Just ask you to bring $10. If, I think. Most of us could afford to bring $10. <coughs> if you can't, obviously we know some people can't. You can always pray. Uh, there will be opportunities for you to put some sweat labor into it as well. Also going along with that, we're looking at some other further opportunities down the road. We have some ideas like a skip it month, skip coffee, skip, where's Pastor Terry? I don't know. He might not be able to do that one. <laughs> uh, a subscription detox. I mean, I, you know, there's subscriptions that you have. Maybe you look through your bank, bank statement and say, oh, I don't use this anymore. We thought of uh, an idea of everybody trying to purchase chairs for yourself, for your family, for the building. So that's an idea we have. This one really got me, a pastor's and deacon's fitness challenge. <laughs> How many could give to that? You know, 
have a little bit of a competition. That might be fun. If any of you have any creative ideas or fun ideas, also bring them to you know, myself, any of the uh, finance committee guys. We'd be glad to take those. Um, just remember one thing. This isn't for us. This is for God and reaching the rest of Denver and more of Denver for the, the cause of Christ. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Randy. Fitness challenge, eh? <laughs> Hopefully I'll be healed up by then. Uh, appreciate all of your prayers. I wasn't even going to make mention of any of it, but I appreciate all your prayers. The fact that I'm able to be here today and lead singing is all God. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, your love for me and for your prayers for our family. Let me go over a few facts with you about Nigeria this morning. Brother Brian, did you get switched over or are you still having troubles? Okay, uh, so we're highlighting the country of Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is Africa's most or heavily populated country. So if you go to the map, Brother Brian, uh, Ethiopia was on the east coast of Africa, uh, Nigeria is kind of nestled there in what I'll call Central or West Africa. Uh, you can go to the next slide, I believe. Uh, this is a city of uh, one of the towns that's located there in Nigeria, a beautiful part of the world. The mountains there are just uh, spectacular. I've never been, but the pictures that I've seen uh, online were just incredible. Go to the next slide if you don't mind. Uh, this is the capital city that's nestled uh, right along the coast there. Uh, uh, the, uh, I guess that would be Atlantic Ocean, I believe. Uh, so a large city, uh, much more wealthy than Ethiopia. If you remember last week, Ethiopia, one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, but Nigeria is actually basically the opposite. It's one of the richest countries in the continent of Africa. You can go to the next slide if you would, Brother Brian. Um, 490 ethnic groups. Uh, located in the country of Africa. Again, I said uh, it, it was the most heavily, po heavily populated country. Of those 490 ethnic groups, there's 470 known languages. Now, I say known because uh, there's a lot of tribes and things like that that maybe are unknown at this time. Uh, so 470 known languages. The official language, however, is English, so it makes it a little easier uh, most of their trade, things like that, is done in English. Uh, the Most of the population would speak English. Uh, so that makes it a little easier for missionaries when they're going uh, to uh, Nigeria. Uh, again, I mentioned already, in contrast with Ethiopia, the, the wealth that is uh, enjoyed uh, in Nigeria, I say wealth, their average annual salary is still only $9,300. Um, much better than $490 uh, with Ethiopia. Over 50% of the population is Sunni Muslim, a uh, very dark uh, part of the world uh, when it comes to spirituality. Uh, 95 million people live in Nigeria, and 50% of those uh, are Muslim. 12 of the states within Nigeria actually still practice or do practice uh, Sharia law, which is uh, not friendly, uh, especially to women, uh, but not friendly to many uh, of its inhabitants. Uh, the good news is that Bearing Precious Seed uh, does have missionaries there in Nigeria that are asking for whole Bibles. Uh, so Bearing Precious Seed will be providing 10,000 whole Bibles to the country of Nigeria, and we're excited to be able to be a part of that. Uh, Brother Brian, if you would go to the next slide. Uh, this will show you some progress of our goal. So, so far we've had $1,390 come in. I know more came in this morning. I saw some quarter books and things like that from children. Uh, so that's great. Uh, the picture to the bottom right is representative of those rolls of paper that would go onto the print press. Uh, these rolls that are highlighted are showing what our goal will be. Uh, when we're done, technically our goal is just shy of six rolls. Uh, so we won't quite fill in that last roll if we do hit our goal. Uh, but we've already been able to purchase almost over one and a half rolls of paper. Uh, so to God be the glory for that. I appreciate your giving uh, to the Lord's work and to the ministry of publishing Bibles. Some of you have asked, well, how do we give? You're right. I have not actually mentioned that yet. Uh, there, are, there are some envelopes out in the foyer that say National Bible Publishing Month. 
you can use one of those envelopes or you can just put it in with your regular giving and just mark it for National Bible Publishing Month if you want the acrostic NBP, NBPM uh, would be the easiest way instead of writing it all out but you can just do that in your regular tithes and offerings and I appreciate uh, those who have given. I think we have the video ready and actually sounds working for this service. Uh, so this is just a two minute um, clip from Brother Money and then we'll go ahead and sing our last song. Pastor Schweitzer. Mount Zion Baptist Church, I am your missionary, Dale Money, and I'm here at Bearing Precious Seed after hours running the forklift. Now, they don't know about it, so please don't tell them. We are in the middle of National Bible. Pastor Schweitzer, Mount Zion Baptist Church, I am your missionary, Dale Money, and I'm here at Bearing Precious Seed after hours running the forklift. Now, they don't know about it, so please don't tell them. We are in the middle of National Bible Publishing Month, the time of the year where we focus on the publishing of the Word of God, the awareness of the publishing of the Word of God, and for raising funds for the printing of the Word of God. Now, these rolls behind me are paper, and these are rolls of paper as well, and these will go on our press soon. Each roll of paper weighs about 12 to 1,400 pounds. If we rolled this roll of paper out, it would roll out to about 10 miles, and that's a pretty amazing statistic. But this roll of paper costs uh, $750 to purchase. Our press can run a truckload of paper, which is about... $20,000 a day if we run it all day. And so this is an important piece to our operation, paper. We need paper to print the Word of God, obviously. Um, this roll of paper can produce about 400 whole Bibles or about 1,800 New Testaments. Now, but we need help. And so we ask churches to get involved. Maybe you could buy a roll of paper. Maybe a couple of families could chip in together and buy a roll of paper. Maybe the church can buy a couple rolls of paper, whatever it takes. But we need the paper to print the Word of God and to send it to the missionaries. Well, I think I hear something. It might be the authorities. So I better get this forklift back. I just want to let you know that I love you. I appreciate your involvement in National Bible Publishing Month. Thank you for your support for our family and our ministry over the years. May God continue to use you for his glory. I better go. Those videos were published in 2020. Uh, so the figure of 750, uh, now if you remember, that roll of, same roll of paper costs $850 today. Uh, so the cost has gone up for them uh, substantially across many of the board. Uh, but just so you're aware and we're excited, Brother Money will actually be with us next year uh, for the first Sunday of National Bible Publishing Month, and we're excited about that as well. If you would take your hymnals one last time with me, turn to hymn number 524, He Hideth My Soul. Hymn number 524, let's all stand together as we sing in junior church can be dismissed at this time.
number of guests and visitors today. Why don't you turn around and greet one another as she plays. Let's sing that chorus a cappella again. All these songs have been excellent a cappella songs, but let's sing that chorus a cappella on the last. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. In the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Thankful for a wonderful Savior this morning. You may be seated. This time, the work girls will come and play a special chorus.
ladies. Hard to believe it was just a couple of months ago when I would say Courtney was had a near-death experience and spent weeks at Hershey Medical Center. And here she is back playing again. So uh, I didn't expect that so quickly. Were you faking it all along? No, 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 <laughs> she was not. Uh, she was definitely going through some major health issues and so good to have her back and uh, back in ministering again for the Lord. The teens do a Bible quizzing practice today as well. They go to another church this afternoon and uh, go up against the various churches just in all in preparation for the final uh, week of that. So be in prayer for our young people as they do that as well today. It is very good to have you. A number of people are first-time guests and visitors with us as well. We welcome you. Uh, Great to have you to our service. It is our privilege and blessing today to have one of our missionary families here with us, uh, Dr. Chuck and his wife, Joe Harding, are missionaries uh, to America, and uh, they are missionaries most prominently to our politicians in Washington, D.C., and so what a mission field, what an opportunity they have uh, very often, and as he already encouraged earlier, uh, please, if you can, come back tonight, because I think sometimes we do get really kind of down in the mouth, really negative speaking, when there's a lot of great things actually happening. And uh, when you get around the Hardings, they begin to share with you story after story of what the Lord is doing. Their eyes both light up, and uh, they really, with excitement, tell you of the various things that are happening in Washington, D.C., and with some of our politicians, and we thank the Lord for it. And so uh, Dr. Harding is really a historian, uh, but also uh, loves to get in the midst of the politics and help and I believe he's really kind of helping to shape the, the present history of our nation and how we need help in that area. Before he preaches, though, he's going to come and sing for us and then go right into the preaching of the Word of God. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, sir. It's a great old Fanny Crosby song. I, one of my favorites, my Savior, first of all. She met John Sweeney in upstate New York where they used to have some Great times of fellowship and preaching, conferences, and at the end of the day, of course, in the 1800s, they didn't have air conditioning, so they'd go out and they'd sit in the veranda of one of those grand hotels, and they were talking, and John Sweeney said, so Fanny, do you think we'll even recognize our friends when we get to heaven? And initially, her response was positive. Then she said, wait a minute, John, I think I understand what you're saying. Uh, You're wondering if an old woman, blind all of her life, would recognize anyone, let alone her savior. She said... I've given that some thought because when I see the person that I believe is our Savior, I'm going to go up to him and ask him, may I see your hands? And when I see the nail prints in his hands, I'll know that's my Savior. He said, oh, Fanny, that would make a wonderful song. She said, no, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. A little miffed, you know. So they met the next morning in breakfast. She dictated the words to this song, and John R. Sweeney then put them to music, and my Savior, first of all. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and his smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know him. I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the print of the nails in his hands. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come. And our parting at the river I recall to the sweet gates of Eden they will sing my welcome home. But I long to meet my Savior first of all, for I shall know him 
I shall know him and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hands. <clears throat> Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white. He will lead me where no tears shall ever fall. In the glad song of ages, I will mingle with delight. But I long to meet my Savior first of all, for I shall know him. I shall know him, and redeemed by his side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, by the print of the nails in his hand. Well, I bring you greetings from the swamp. We're still trying to drain it. Amen. Uh, but there's some wonderful people there. Oh, I do hope you come back tonight. Thank you, sister, for playing for me. Appreciate that. I hope you come back tonight because I'm going to encourage you tonight. Uh, by God's grace, for his glory, I'm going to encourage you as to really what's going on. Because, of course, I say this all the time. I've said it before. The news is where they begin with good evening and then proceed to tell you for the next hour why it's not. <laughs> and it doesn't make a difference if it's the right or the left. They all try to sensationalize things, the fear factor, to keep you listening and watching. But I hear from the horse's mouth, so to speak. I'm right there on Capitol Hill. And I'm going to show you some photographs of the people that are there that are truly fighting the good fight of faith and standing for our life our liberty, and our pursuit of happiness. All unalienable rights, as our founding fathers set down in writing, the Declaration of Independence was simply this. It was a compilation of scriptures that had been preached from by pastors in pulpits decades leading up to the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence was not a brainchild of Thomas Jefferson. It was a compilation of biblical truths, over 20 of them, that he had heard and collected and then very eloquently did write. And uh, I'm very thankful <coughs> for that. I'm also thankful in the fact that this is the only country in America that you can come and you become an American. doesn't make any difference where you come from. You can never go to Spain to be a Spaniard, never go to France to be a Frenchman. You can't even go to Great Britain and be a Brit. You'll always be a Yank. But you can come to America. You become an American. No hyphenation needed. We're all proud of our heritage, and, and in saying that, I see, see some people in green. So, happy St. Patrick's Day. My grandmother was Irish. She spoke with an Irish accent. She used to do the Irish blessings. You know, she'd say, so may the sun always shine brightly on your face, and the wind be at your back, and the road rise up to meet your feet, and may the rain fall softly on your fields. But you didn't want to mess with my grandmother either. <laughs> she was this tall, and she had given birth to 11 children. I remember one time I was messing around, and she said in her Irish accent, come here, boy -o. Yes, Grandma. I mean, I was just a little guy, maybe five, six, but I can remember this. She said, if you don't behave yourself, I'm going to put the come hither on you. <laughs> now, I didn't know what the come hither was, but it didn't sound good. So I straightened up for my, for my grandmother, but you know, um, her name, well, our family's last name on that side of the family is Agnew, and it means lambs of God. The legend, or perhaps, you know, legend is always part fact, part fiction, was that one of those holy men, perhaps even St. Patty himself, uh, by the way, St. Patrick was a 
Baptist, a Baptistic preacher, who was not a Catholic, contrary to a lot of the revisionist historians. But he came to my ancestors' house back in all those years ago, and they had just a few sticks and some of that uh, earth that they would burn as fuel and a little bit of food, and so they knew this was a holy man who came and he was preaching the word, so they, they cooked the last bit of fu fuel, uh, food with that fuel, and they served him and then made him a clean bed of uh, hay and, and a, a clean sheet on top by the fireplace like they would always do with those visitors that would come in unannounced. And, uh, and the next morning they woke up and their pantry was filled with food and there was all kinds of firewood and the peat that they would use for fuel. And the saying started getting around, that these are the lambs of God because they took care of a man of God and he performed a, a miracle for them. You say, uh, you believe that God's a God of miracle? Oh, yes, I do. God's still the God of the miracle. How many believe that today? Believe God's still the God of the miracle? Yeah. And, and hey, here's the thing. We need to be praying for miracles, don't we? For our family, for our churches, for our pastor and his wife and our cities, our states, our country. We need to be praying for miracles. And so I'm very, very thankful for that. And so uh, if you're wearing the green, okay, that's good. And if you're wearing the orange, that's better. So what do you mean? Well, because the green were the, the Catholics and the orange were the Protestants, okay? And now you say, well, what, what do you wear? Well, I was a Baptist, so I'm neither. <laughs> so orange is green, I don't know. I'm a crazy mixed up kid maybe, okay? But uh, in any case, uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad you're here today. How many are glad to be in church today? Say amen. amen. How many would rather be here than the best jail in the area? <laughs> okay, that's good. I'd like to uh, introduce you to my, my wife. Uh, we have been uh, enjoying one another's uh, uh, company and uh, serving the Lord, loving God, loving one another uh, for 48 plus years. So wave at everyone. Honey, there she is right there. Amen. I, uh, I met her when she was 17 and I was 20. And I met her in art school. I was a portrait painter for a while and, and she was working on a drawing and I walked over and uh, I said, oh, very nice. She said, oh, you like my drawing? I said, I wasn't talking about the drawing. <laughs> you say, you're a smooth operator. Hey, it worked. Here she is 48 years later. Okay, you young men, okay, you leave that to the professionals. Don't, uh, don't, don't go there, okay? But uh, we have had a wonderful time together uh, in the time that God's given us and hope for many years to come in serving him. I'm so glad to be back here. I love your pastor, his wife, this, this church family. I love a congregation that is high energy, that is ready to laugh and to love and to learn. And I always, we always feel right at home when we come here. I, I have a bunch of materials, but I'm going to go over those at the end of the service with your uh, pastor's permission. I already got your pastor's permission, so I'll put those right there so I don't forget that, but I'll, I'll go under his direction. But and look, someone said, one of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson specifically, only a educated people are going to be a free people. So we need to start getting educated as to who we are. Start wondering, and you know, what are we all about? Well, America is a, an amazing country. It is the most powerful, prosperous nation in the world today. And that's not by accident. That's by design, because we have a constitution that's biblically based. But I want to talk about all the time that has gone in to various things, and yes, I am a student of history. I'm a student of his story, which is the Bible. You say, well, the Bible and secular history, and as far as I'm concerned, there is no such thing as secular history, because history talks about his story. The further back we look, the further ahead we can see. So we need to be those people that have a circumspect walk. And I want to talk today about time well spent. Take your Bibles, go with me to Revelation chapter 10, Revelation chapter 10. This is the Apostle John. The Apostle John was boiled in oil <clears throat> by all the historical evidences that we find. Different apostles were killed in different ways. Uh, Peter, notably, uh, was said to have been crucified upside down. And, of course, Paul uh, lost his head on the chopping block. Uh, John, they boiled him in oil. Now, 
you didn't die necessarily when you were being boiled in oil, but the huge blisters that came up all over your body would get infected and you'd die a very slow, painful death. But here is something that they didn't really think through. Once they boiled him in oil, they banished him to an island by the name of Patmos. Patmos was very well known for its salt mines. There was so much salt being mined, it was salt in the air, purified his wounds. And so he lived. You know the providence of God. Isn't that good? Amen. And so he wrote, of course, the book of Revelation. One revelation, not the book of Revelations, one revelation. And right here in chapter 10 of the book of Revelation, it says this, <clears throat> verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, there, that there should be time no longer. So there's going to be a point where we will all unless the rapture occurs, step from time into eternity, where there will be no time for us. I remember a particular preacher, his wife died uh, many years before him. And she said, honey, I'll, I'll be waiting for you. He said, honey, you'll be in eternity. And, and you'll get there and you'll turn around and I'll be there. Because you're in eternity. I'm in time. I'll wait for our reunion, but you really won't be waiting, so to speak, because you'll be in eternity. And I want to speak today about that precious commodity that we call time. Heavenly Father, once again now we come before you. And we're so thankful for thy word that's forever settled in heaven. It's eternal. You've allowed us to handle it, to read it, to study it, to memorize it, to meditate upon it even to be able to listen to it with the technology that we have today. By faith, by hearing the Word of God, we receive our faith. We thank you, Lord, that we can glean from it those eternal truths, apply them to our life. Even, Lord, through thy Word, we can come to a point where we can accept the gift of eternal life and go to heaven and know that we have a home in heaven. And, Lord, we pray now, as I step back, that you would step forward. Articulate my speech, clarify, direct my thoughts. But most of all, we ask for your Holy Spirit, through and by that unction that only you can give us, that the Comforter, the Holy Ghost of God, would be with us today in his presence, that he would indwell me as your servant today, and that everything that's said might be in honor and glory unto thee in thy name. Father, we ask, Lord, all of this through and by the authority that's in the name of your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. Amen. So time, our precious commodity, the most precious commodity that we have. Now, the greatest possession, most precious possession we have is our eternal life, the gift of God that he's given us. I hope everyone here today has accepted that gift of eternal life. And by the way, if you're a visitor and you don't like me, come back because you'll like Brother Swicer. Okay, But what I'm saying is, look, we all have a certain amount of time. We don't know what that time is, how much time that is. But we all have a certain amount of time. It's something that is so precious. When someone gives you their time, they're giving you the most precious thing that they have, you see, that commodity of time. Our time is either invested in eternity or spent on the temporal. Think about that. It can be spent, but it cannot be saved. And it can be wasted, by the way. Now, time is free yet precious. We can't own it, but we can use it. But once we use it, you get this, we can never get it back. Hey, time in church is time well spent. This is time invested in the eternal because we get closer to God. In fact, when you come to church, there may be someone here that doesn't even know the Lord as Savior. You say, what are you talking about, Brother Harding? Why would we be in church? Hey, I went to church and I, I had never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. I knew that God was God. I knew that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross and shed his perfect blood for my sin. I knew there was a heaven to gain and a, and a hell to shun, but I had never accepted the gift of eternal life. You say, what do you mean? It's one thing to know that there is a God. It's another thing to know God. At the age of 21, someone took the Bible and said, 
do you know for sure when you're going to heaven? This was my response. I hope so. <laughs> That's when that guy's antenna went, you, you don't know? Well, I hope so. I, I guess I will. You know, my good will outweigh my bad. He said, no, 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 no. He said, let me tell you. Let me show you real quick. And he showed me the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He said, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. He said, what does that mean? None of us can match ourselves to the God-man, Jesus Christ. And this is what he said also. He said, now look, I want you to understand this, okay? Very clearly. God doesn't send anyone to hell. Well, I thought he did. No. He said, what does wage mean? I said, something you earn? God says, the wages of your sin is death. You earn the right to die. But Jesus Christ came to give you a gift of eternal life. And then he said this, is there any way you can earn a gift? By going to church? By giving a certain amount of money? By trying to live a good life? No. It's by grace that you're saved through faith that none of ourselves it's a gift of god not of works lest any man should boast he said you can't work your way to heaven you have to accept the gift of eternal life i said no one's ever told me that before he said well i'm telling you right now in fact i'm not telling you god's telling you i said well okay well, what do i need to do then to accept that gift he said turn from your way to god's way and this is what i said i don't even know if i want to give up some of the things that i'm doing he said you don't have to all you need to do is come to God with the desire to live a life through him, and he will give you the desire to stop doing those things that are not pleasing, start doing those things that are pleasing to him. You come exactly the way you are as a child. I said, really? He said, yes. And just with the desire to turn your life from your way to, to God's way, because this is what he said, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. He said, you're on your way to death. And not just physical death, eternal death. But in God, there's life and life eternity. I said, what do I need to do? He said, just have a word of prayer. Tell God you're a sinner because you've sinned. You know that your wage of sin is death. But he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to give you the gift of eternal life. And all you need to do is accept it. And God says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall promise be saved. I said, is it that easy? He said, it's that easy. I said, wow, that's amazing. In fact, I was so excited. I said, wow, and then I said it backwards, wow. <laughs> and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And from that point to this, when I'm 70 years old today, I've never one time doubted where I'm going because it's not my good works that's going to get me there. It's because I've accepted the gift of eternal life and my destination is forever changed in heaven. Now, if you haven't changed your destination, I would take the time to do it today. Amen? So time don't waste time on regrets. Now, if someone doesn't get saved, they'll spend eternity regretting. Because when you go to hell, there is no way out. And hell will be dumped into the lake of fire, and that's eternal. There's no hope in hell. You get that, right? Well, Brother Hardy, why are you talking about hell? Jesus preached on hell more than he did anything else. You understand that, right? Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I want people to stay out of there. God wants people to stay out of there. The, look, the lake of fire wasn't meant for us. It was meant for the devil and his angels. But if we don't follow God by default, that's where we're going as well. So don't waste time on regrets today. Oh, I wish I would have done that. Hey, forgetting those things which are behind, pressing forward unto those things which are before. Amen? That's what we need to do. Don't waste time on worries. Well, I'm worried about this. Hey, worries next to atheism. Don't worry about things. You can be concerned. Be concerned all you want. Cry out to God. When you're concerned, you can cry out to God because God's the one that changes things. Prayer in God changes things. But don't worry about it. So when people just sit there and they worry, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Be concerned, but don't worry. Don't spend your time on grudges, wasting on grudges. Well, I'm going to teach him. I'm just not going to forgive that person. Don't trip over your bottom lip on the way out. Amen? Well, he didn't apologize to me. Were we in the eighth grade? Excuse me, eighth graders, if there's any eighth graders in here. Okay? All right? What I'm saying is, look, hey, people don't need to apologize to you for you to forgive them. It's going to be much better for you to forgive, to forget, and go on. Hey, I'll guarantee you, I'm 70 years old. You know how many times I've been attacked? How, how many times I have been maligned? And, and you, what do you do, Brother Harney? Forgive them and go on. Do you, do you go and, uh, now, look, 
if I was younger, okay, and, and lost like I was until I was 21, I would have probably handled it a little bit differently as I did in those days. You can tell why. Because I have a Roman nose. Rome's all over my face. Because this is how I used to settle things back in those days. I don't do that anymore. I let God fight my battles for me. Amen? So I don't waste time on grudges, nor on being angry at the wrong things. Amen? The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. But God does say, be angry and sin not. See, there's a balance there. So who do we need to be angry at? Old smutty face, the devil. Not at the people that he's using. Amen? At the devil. Now, the devil uses a lot of people on the left. Someone in history called them useful idiots. I kind of like that term. It does definitely describe who they are. And someone says, well, idiot, that's a derogatory term. The French term idiot, the etymology means someone that is self-centered, that doesn't know anything, doesn't care anything about the body politic and living in harmony and peace with everyone else just cares about himself. That's an idiot. There's a lot of useful idiots. And the reason why they are who they are is because all they want is more power. Because more power, they have more opportunity to gain wealth in the wrong way. I'm talking about people in leadership many times too. Amen? Because why? Well, because the love of money. Now, there's no, there's no problem with money in itself. But the love of money is the root of all evil. What part don't we get about that? The root of all evil is the love of money. And I'm sorry to say that's how some of our leadership is looking at things today. So don't, but don't allow the devil to get you to waste time on the wrong type of anger, okay? It's been said in the lifetime of the American, the average American will spend six months waiting at stoplights. I hate stoplights. I am an A personality. Now, your pastor and his wife probably found that out when they came down and spent some time with me in my hot rod suburban. <laughs> Amen. They, they didn't say anything like, whoa, but maybe they wanted to. I don't know. But uh, what, what I'm saying is, look, I, I want to get there. Now, I follow the speed limits most of the time. Okay. I know there's a police officer in here, and so I'm not going to go any further than that. Okay. All right. But uh, if I'm at a stoplight, and it's out in the country, and there's no one around, and, it, and the light turns red, what do you do, Brother Harding? That's a nana. What do you mean? None of your business. Okay. And so... <laughs> But what I'm saying is I, I don't like stoplights. You think about that. Six months sitting at a stoplight. Eight months opening junk mail. You will never win the publisher's clearinghouse. Okay? So if you have more chance of being struck by lightning twice in the same place. So take that and shred it. Get a shredder and just shred that junk mail. Now, you can't shred your bills. You've got to pay those, okay? But shred your junk mail. Get those things. I mean, can you imagine eight months opening junk mail? One year looking for misplaced objects. <laughs> Honey, did you see my keys? Where's my wallet at? Huh? Can you imagine? I mean, that's crazy. My wife says, our house swallows up things. Well, it really doesn't. We just, you know, misplace things and forget where we put them, you know. But what I'm saying is, look, all of these things add up. Now, I don't mind this. Six years eating. I like that. <laughs> and I can tell some of you spend that time too. Okay? <laughs> but what I'm saying is, look, hey, all of these things add up. Can you imagine when we get to heaven? We're going to be eating. Brother Randy, we're going to be eating at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Someone said, how long do you think we'll eat the marriage supper of the Lamb? I don't know. We're in eternity. <laughs> and everything's calorie free. <laughs> I like that too, okay? Now, there's not going to be any meat up there, okay? So all your meat eaters, me included, uh, but you'll have other things that would be even better than that, okay? I'll guarantee you. But, hey, I don't know how much time because we're going to be in eternity. But all of those things, all those minutes, all those times, they add up. My question is today as we begin is what would be the number of the time that we've spent with God so far in our life? What's that number? How many years is that? If you're a new Christian, how many months is that? Or a very new Christian, how many weeks is that? I've heard some Christians actually say, some people, I'm too busy to develop a relationship with God. If you're too busy to develop a relationship with God, you're too busy. Hey, we need to make time for God because there's coming when time is no longer. Hebrews 11, you know, that's a hall of 
faith, right? The great people of faith, amen? And they come from all different walks, and we look at this. i just go through a few of them very quickly for you. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more, sacri- more excellent, excellent excuse me, sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of the things not yet, seen not yet, excuse me, of God of things not yet seen. <laughs> Three times a charm. Okay, uh, prepared an ark. Can you imagine CNN interviewing him? Because you know, in pre-Diluvian times, it had never rained. You get that, right? We had a water sphere around the earth and the dew came up from the earth. There was no big bodies of water to float a boat around, and he was building a boat several football fields long. Can you imagine someone coming up to Noah? So, Mr. Noah, what what are you doing? I'm building a boat. Uh, Why? Uh, Because it's going to rain. What is rain? There's going to be a flood. A flood? I mean, for 120 years, they thought he was crazy. You get that, right? Or, or can you believe someone like MS LSD interviewing him? Yeah, I said it right. I don't know what color of the sky is in their world, okay? I think they practice looking at a mirror and lying and keeping a straight face. All those pundits and prognosticators. Can you think of someone that did something so completely nonsensical to man? Such as Moses, when he's come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. I mean, he left all the splendors of the ancient world of Egypt to go with those people that were enslaved. Does it make any sense to you? It didn't make any sense to those people in those days. How about Abraham? When God called him to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and went out. Now listen to this. Not knowing whether he went. How about that? God says, okay, I I want you to go. Go where? Just go. Uh, Lord, I don't know if I heard you right or not. You heard me right. I want you to go. He just left. I want you to go. God's telling Abraham to leave the confines and the safety of your walled city and all your family, and go into the dangers of the desert, the world. And he went. Why? For he looked for a city which hath foundations, who builder and maker is God. That's why. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. And Esau, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of departing the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Over and over and over again. By man's standards, folks... Listen to me now. By man's standards, illogical, crazy, impossible, yet miraculous. All of these people, and this type of behavior wasn't even allocated just to the people of the Bible. Our founding fathers, can you believe what our founding fathers did? You know how many times 56 men that were multi-billionaires, you say, well, history calls them millionaires, by comparatively speaking to who they would have been today, the wealth that they had then, and how it would be measured today. It wouldn't be in the millions, it would be in the billions. 56 billionaires, most of them gentry class. What's gentry class, Brother Harding? It's the American royalty that we had right here in America. And you couldn't be born, excuse me, you couldn't uh, basically buy yourself into the gentry class, you couldn't uh, marry into the gentry class, you had to be born a gentry, you were of royal blood or you weren't. They turned their back on that. They said, we're going to do this, for the good of the common man. Unbelievable. 56 multi-billionaires signed a document called the Declaration of Independence that was going to put themselves, their fortunes, and their families in harm's way. They had little children at home. You know how many times that's happened in history? Once, right here. Why? Because of the pulpit and the sacred fire that emanated from the pulpit, where the man of God, preaching from the word of God, through and by the Holy Spirit of God, about the Son of God, allowed the people to accept the gift of eternal life and to become the people of God. That's what made all the difference. And now we are saying, well, you shouldn't be preaching about 
God and country from the pulpit? Are you kidding? That's why we have a country. That's why we even have, because the unsung heroes of the war for independence were pastors and itinerant preachers like myself, called evangelists, going around preaching these types of things that instilled in our founding fathers that sacred fire that allowed them to sign a document that was going to, by two-thirds plus of our nation's population, make them traitors. Wow. Put that on for size. And, oh, by the way, out of the 56 men that signed the Declaration, only six of them made it back to sign the Constitution about a decade later. Many of them died from battle wounds, complete abject poverty. They died not even seeing their families again. One went to debtor's prison. These men, they truly paid the price for us. Illogical? I would say so. Unbelievable? Yes. Miraculous? By all means. And the first time that Boston was attacked by the British. You know what they did? The Continental Congress, they didn't get on their horses and in their carriages and ride off to try to escape capture. They got on their knees and they prayed for three hours through Psalm 35. And John Adams tells Abigail in a letter, even the Quakers, you know, Pennsylvania Quakers, <laughs> very stoic people, you know, never show any emotion. He said, even the Quakers were moved to tears because God's presence was so palpable, you could cut it with a knife. That is time well spent. So all of those people, may I submit to you, the greatest decision that they made was not building an ark, was not even founding a nation, a miraculous nation. The greatest decision that they made that led to their faith, that led to these miraculous things that God allowed them to do, was simply this, deciding they were going to spend more time with God. Now, couldn't we all do that today? It takes no particular ability. It takes no particular talent to simply decide, I, I read my Bible, but I'm going to read more of my Bible. I pray, but I'm going to get a prayer list. I'm going to pray more. Folks, God's everything, and I'm nothing. But may I, I tell you that since Decades ago, I got really serious about prayer. It is amazing what God has done in our life through prayer and all the answers to prayer. You understand? And I should ask, what time do I need to stop? Now? Okay, like now. No? You know? Uh, he doesn't know what time it is. Okay. All right. All right. I, I'm almost done. Everybody okay? Anyone have a roast burning? That was yesteryear anyway, right? Okay, but I am almost done. So I want to submit to you, look, time well spent is being here. By the way, time well spent is coming back tonight. This is God's day, not God's morning. Huh? We want to see God do some. I don't know about you. I want to see God do some miraculous things through my life. Don't you? I want to see God answer some miraculous prayers. Don't you? You say, well, Brother Hardy, it's been a, a while since I've seen God literally answer a prayer in a miraculous way. It might be because we're not praying for miracles. This isn't something that, you know, this group or that group has a handle on. It's biblical. God wants us to ask. He wants us to ask. Some of the great men of prayer, they have actually written books. And, and, they've, and they've said, and, and they're notable for prayer. They say, when I get to heaven and I walk up to the angels, I hope the angels say, here comes big mouth. <laughs> I hope that's what they say about me too, because I want to open my mouth wide and I want to pray about everything. I want to be praying all the time. I want to be praying for some, uh, some things that God, only God can do. Amen? Now, did I, did I tell you, did I tell you the folks about my, my suits the last time I was here? About my suits? Let me, let me just tell you this real, real, real quick. Okay. My wife, we, uh, I was down to two suits. Now, I wear suits all the time, so I wear suits out. So I had two good suits left, and I was in Louisiana, and, and I had a, a suit uh, on. It wasn't threadbare, but I just, I just I said to my wife, I need some new suits. And when I do that, of course, you know, I go vertical as well. Well, the next church I went to, I was the keynote speaker of the conference, and a guy came up to my wife and said, does your husband need some new suits? 
Now, he couldn't tell by the suit I was wearing that I needed some new suits, but he said, does your husband need some new suits? I said, yes. She said, yes, he does. He just told me. And he came to me. He said, hey, your wife said you need some new suits. I said, yes, I do. He said, I'm going to take you to get some suits tomorrow. I went, okay, <laughs> great. And so he, now, I thought I was going to go to J.C. Penney and pick some up off the rack for 70% off, you know. No, he took me to a men's clothiers, and he called the manager over and said, fit this guy for some suits. I went, what? He said, yeah, I'm going to get you some custom suits. I said, custom suits? Oh, I don't do that. He said, well, you're going to do it today. And so the, the guy said, here's all the materials, here's the lining, and they started measuring me for a suit. And then this guy started asking me questions I didn't know. He said, he said do you want pick stitching? I said, what? P-I-C, pick stitching. I said, what's that? He said, it's a special stitching. I said, is it extra? He said, no. I said, yes, I want pick stitching. <laughs> there it is right there. There's the pick stitching. This is one of the suits. Then he said this. He said, do you want the pockets straight or slanted? I said, is it extra to slant them? He said, no. I said, slant them babies. <laughs> and then he said, do you want a ticket pocket? I said, what's a ticket pocket? He said, I don't know. Do you want one? I said, is it extra? He said, no. I said, yeah, I want a ticket pocket. So there's my ticket pocket right, right there. See my, see, and then, and they said, and pick out the lining, pick out the lining. So I picked out the lining in my suits. What do you think? <laughs> and the guy didn't buy me just one suit, not two suits. He bought me six suits, custom made suits. Then he said something very dangerous. He told my wife, he said, I want you to go pick out some ties and some kerchiefs, not the kind of blow, the kind of show, to match your husband's suits. And he, this is what he told my wife, don't look at the price tags. And you could see my wife, her, her face was beginning to turn, you know, and that crazy smile was beginning to emerge, you know, and she almost went giggling through the store. <laughs> I said, get out of her way, woman on her mission. She will run you down. So she went out, and then, and then he said, would you like some shirts? I said, brother, please stop. He said, no, would you like some shirts? I said, okay, I'll take it. No, he said, I'm going to get you four shirts. He said, measure this guy from shirts. I said, no. He said, yeah, I want you to have some custom-made shirts, Egyptian cotton. He says, really soft. They're like pajamas. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so he said, you like French cuffs? I said, yeah, I, I wear cufflinks. And and what kind of collar? And then he said, would you like some shoes? I said, please stop. Please stop. So he bought me some shoes. He bought me a belt. And gave my wife some money for dresses. You know what he said the next day? This is what he said. He brought in a little sheet of paper and had a, a number on it. He said, you know what this is? I said, no, sir. He said, this came into my office today. It's almost twice of what I spent on you yesterday. It was completely unexpected. He said, you see, you can't outgive God. It's prayer. We need to pray more, don't you think? Because if we do, I'll guarantee you, God will open up the windows of heaven. You won't be able to receive everything that God has for you. And look, I love the suits, but that's nothing compared to what God wants to do for every one of you in here. But if we must spend more time with God. God allows us the accomplishments in our lives to simply be an outflow of our walk with Him, our obedience to Him, our faith in Him that simply comes from spending more time with Him. Every single one of us could get to this altar today. You say, what, what's, what's the altar call? Time well spent. And say, Lord, I'm making a decision today. I'm going to an old-fashioned altar. You say, well, Brother Hardy, I don't normally go to the altar. You know, if we do what we've always done, we'll get what we all, we've always had. Would you like something different? Then let's get out of our comfort zone. Let's move to an altar in just a few minutes. You say, well, I can't bow. You can walk and stand, can't you? You say, God says, humble yourself, submit yourself. That's what this is. That's what the altar call is. This is where God meets his people and does miraculous things right here at the altar. Coming to the altar, time well spent. So as we see ourselves in the last times, in perilous times, we need to know there's an appointed time also, that our time is not even our time, it's in the hand of God, as the sweet psalmist says in Psalm 31, verse 15, my times are in thy hand. 
And God will actually and can actually lengthen our days, as it says in 1 Kings chapter 3, and verse 14, if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my, statu my, my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then will I will lengthen thy days. I don't know about you. How many want your days lengthened? I want mine lengthened, amen? And you say, well, I'm in overtime. Well, good, let's keep on going, right? I wasn't talking about the message, by the way. Okay, I know I'm in overtime too, okay? But we need to trust the Lord in all times. He changes the times and the seasons. By the way, he's going to change, hopefully, this man in the White House who thinks he's king. Sometimes I don't know who he is, but he's going to change him if we get out there and vote. And I'm going to tell you much more about that tonight. So for such a time as this, in the present time, make sure we understand our time is short. Let us redeem the time. Let us understand the signs of the time. But most of all, today, let us make a decision to spend more time with God. When we get to heaven at the Bema seat, won't you want God to be able to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So I'm going to ask you to do something today. And that's just a little different. I'm not going to ask the piano to play. I'm going to bow right here and I'm going to pray and ask God to help me to spend more time with him. Because every day I want to spend just a little more time, a little more time. I'm going to ask you to stand and if you want to see God move in your life, I want you to move to this old-fashioned altar right now without any piano playing. If this is what God wants, time well spent is at this altar today. Let's all stand. So other people, if, if you, you, you know, just, and you can walk to an old-fashioned altar for a few minutes, can you not? And stand here. You say, well, why is this? Because it's humbling. It's submitting ourselves to God. Let's say, Lord, I just want to spend some more time with you. I want to spend more time in Bible reading. I want to spend more time in prayer. I want to spend more time giving of tracts and, and showing people and telling people how to know the Lord. And I want to give my time to others. So that when it comes, there's time no longer. My time will be well spent. Heavenly Father, you see your people today. Their humble spirit, oh God, they want to spend more time with you. So Father, we pray, as we know you will, answer their prayer. Give them that desire, the wherewithal, to simply more, spend more time with you. Father, that we might see you move in our life for the salvation of souls for the betterment of our nation. So the freedom of the pulpit and the gospel of your precious Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, can go forward. Hear our prayer, Lord. And as these are praying, 